Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Executive Appeals Committee meeting. My name is Isabella Nicosia, representing ISO Stakeholder Affairs. I'll be facilitating the web conference today. I'm also joined here in the room by the committee, um, including Steve Berberick, President and CEO, Roger Collington, Vice President of General Counsel and Chief Compliance Officer, and Stacey Crowley, Vice President of External and Customer Affairs. Also in the room is Joanne Serena, David Zlotlow, Abdul Rahman Muhammad Ali, and Milos Bosnek. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started today. This call is being recorded and the recording is for informational and convenience purposes only, and any related transcription should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. So with that, I will hand it over to Stacey Crowley and we'll get started. Thank you, Isabella. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Executive Appeals Committee meeting. Um, as Isabella said, my name is Stacey Crowley. I'm the Vice President of External and Customer Affairs. Um, the ISO Business Practice Manual Change Management Process enables the ISO and affected parties to propose and track all requested changes to ISO Business Practice Manuals called Proposed Revision Requests, or PRRs. The process also includes the right to appeal a final decision for reconsideration on a PRR to an appeals committee consisting of ISO executives. Uh, just for context, we had an appeals uh, committee in discussion uh, several years ago, probably back um, at least four years ago, and through that process, it was amicably resolved. During today's meeting, the committee will hear from two appellants to six cities, uh, that being the cities of Anaheim, Azusa, Banning, Colton, Pasadena, and Riverside, California, and PG&E, in, including ISO staff and other interested stakeholders on um, proposed revision request 1122, the inappropriate reporting of forced outages, which affects the BPM for outage management. So with that, I'll, uh, the agenda is pulled up here just so you can see the, um, the scheduled set of events to order. Uh, as I'm making opening remarks, we'll follow that um, by Isabella, who will again talk a little bit about the BPM change management process and the overview of the timeline that occurred. That will be followed up by the ISO staff perspective on PRR 1122, and that will be um, led by David Zotlo. And that will be followed by the appellant remarks and the question and answer from the committee. That will be representatives from both six cities and uh, uh, pg &E. That will be followed by any public stakeholder comments and Q&A from the committee. So first, the ISO will provide an overview of the BPM management process, um, and I will, uh, I'm sorry, I'll turn it over to Isabella to talk about the process a little bit. All right. Thanks, Stacey. So again, my name is Isabella Nicosia, Associate Stakeholder Engagement Policy Specialist here at the ISO, and I'll be providing an overview of the BPM change management process as well as going through the process timeline for proposed revision request 1122. Um, so in accordance with our tariff and BPM change management process, any changes to the California ISO BPMs must be initiated, initiated by submittal of a proposed revision request, otherwise, otherwise referred to as a PRR. Each PRR goes through a two-month stakeholder process, beginning with the submittal of the PRR. This process allows participants to submit comments after initial submission, posting of the recommendation, and posting of the final decision. The process also allows the ISO to post responses to comments, address questions, provide clarification, and post recommendations in a final decision. The BPM change management meetings take place each month to discuss each PRR that is either in the initial or recommendation stage of the process. Following the issuance of a final decision, the submitter or any affected market participant may submit an appeal to the ISO for reconsideration of the final decision. Specific to PRR 1122, the key dates can be seen here on slide four with the ISO submitting PRR 1122 on January 10th, 2019. Initial comments were received by six cities, PG&E, NCE, NCPA, and Calpine on February 12th, and these were discussed during a February 26th stakeholder call. In March, the ISO posted the recommendation, and recommendation comments were received from stakeholders, and the ISO posted responses to comments which were discussed during a March 26, 2019 call. Six cities and PG&E filed appeals in April 2019, with the ISO posting an answering brief, leading us to today's appeals committee meeting. The remaining dates will be discussed at the end of today's meeting. 
Great, thank you. Thank, thanks, Isabella. Uh, now we'll go to David Blatlow, who will um, provide the ISO perspective on PRR 1122. Does this make sense just to verify that who we have on the phone um, to make sure that they're on the phone? Sure. And can hear the whole proceeding. Yes, we did that. We did, did you do that as well? Go, we got people right. in with that six cities. All right, I just want to make sure. Okay, uh, good afternoon. This is David Blatlow from the ISO's legal department. Um, the staff position on this appeal is developed at length in the answering brief that's been posted. Um, so my goal this afternoon in our presentation is to emphasize a few of the key points, uh, explain the purpose of the PRR, why we believe it was an appropriate uh, change to the BPM, and then finally respond to some of the main points raised in opposition to the PRR, both by uh, the appellants, uh, Six Cities and pg &E, as well as uh, I believe it was NCPA and FCE also provided written comments. Um, so moving to the first slide here. Um, first of the top, I want to talk about how PRR 1122 and sort of the, the opposition to it is rather unique in terms of most of the PRRs we deal with. Um, first of all, this PRR and, and the disagreement over it, it's not about a policy dispute as often uh, PRR uh, disagreements can be. It's also, this PRR is not a case as, as PRRs can typically be about the ISO providing implementation details from general tariff language. That's sort of the, the type of BPM change we usually deal with. So uh, what does this PRR involve? So it really involves two things. First of all, it provides a statement from the ISO of our view of what tar our tariff and FERC regulations uh, prohibit in terms of a specific outage reporting practice. Um, and this is the practice we've called plan to force outage reporting. So an important caveat to those statements, first of all, is that this is the ISO's best reading of the tariff and the relevant regulatory language. Um, we have to do the best we can with the language and the sources that are uh, in front of us. FERC can certainly offer the final word on those matters and uh, at some point it might come to that, but unless and until that happens, this is our best understanding and this is what we, we've moved forward with. So that's the first uh, sort of part of the PRR. The second part is then to explain what the ISO plans to do if we suspect that that prohibited conduct has occurred. So it explains that the ISO will evaluate uh, an outage that on its face appears to be uh, planned to force and will ask questions if those questions are not resolved will then um, potentially uh, pass it on to our Department of Market Monitoring, who then follow their established process for considering referrals to FERC's office. Uh, so I think the basic... David, can I ask you a clarifying sure. question? Um, DMM already reviews um, outage requests and changes like this. Is that not correct? They have their own ability to review them, I believe. That's, That's something. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, that's right. So what on the main side of the ISO setting DMM aside, what the PR is really setting out is that you know, operation staff will be proactively reviewing these and reaching out to, to participants when they see this might have happened. Um, so it's sort of happening before it relies on DMM to be doing this screening. And that's, again, the second part of the PR is making clear that, that we will be doing that. So I think the basis of the appeals here are that uh, parties disagree with our tariff interpretation, essentially, and if that interpretation is, in fact, incorrect, then it would stand that the PR 1122 language would be um, removed. So I think that's, that's the point of the appeal. Um, I think what also makes this PRR and the appeal unique is that um, I mean, when you start to ask what would happen if we removed the PR 1122 language, and I think that's makes this rather different from most other PRRs. Uh, in our view, removing the language, it would not change the ISO's view of what conduct is prohibited. It would not remove the ISO's outage approval authority from the tariff. It would not give generators or transmission operators a blank check to ignore the ISO's outage coordination role. And finally, it would certainly not prohibit the ISO from raising issues of concern to DMM or to FERC. We don't think those, you know, removing the PR 1122 language wouldn't accomplish any of those things. So then, David, I guess the question follows, then why did we do it? Right. So 
the, the point, we have uh, some of the following slides to get, get at this more in length, but we'll say now. Oh, sorry, I can, I can wait. Oh, okay. Or, or All right. But I, I think that's a similar question yeah, because I, I follow what you say on the tariff, and if that exists, then what was driving the PRR? Yeah, so there was, there was some, a lot of thought went into that point. Um, and um, you know what, let's just go, go straight to that slide. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it, that's sort of a, a, a key issue. So yeah. what I'll, I'll, I'll play is we can go to um, slide number four. Well, that's my fourth slide. Uh, yeah, there we go. So just going, going straight, I'll, I'll loop back to some of the substantives for tariff issues, but if we take it as a given for now that we've explained why this plan to forced outage reporting is potentially problematic, we identified it, and then we asked the question, well, what, what do we do about it? When it was uh, starting to become a greater concern around uh, 2017, I think spring, spring of 2017. So there were quite a few instances that were identified. It was become a growing, becoming a growing problem. You know, operations staff were sort of wondering, what do we do about this? Is this allowed, not allowed? How can we address it? Can I ask you a follow-on question to that then? If you notice these in 2017, Abdul, maybe you, you can weigh in as appropriate, um, that when you reviewed these, what did you, did you find that um, they were being changed from plan to force? Can you give, well, I don't want to lead the question. Can you explain what you saw when they changed it from plan to force that became, that led you to think they were problematic? Can you, Abdul Muhammad Ali from Operation. Uh, so we were seeing, we noticed this behavior when we um, start, started denying outages that did not, planned outages that did not provide substitution. Um, some of the participants um, simply resubmitted those outages as forced mm -hmm. uh, the same day or the next day, uh, you know, immediately as we denied them for the same period. Uh, some of them even stated that this is what we're doing. Uh, for the purpose we got denied and we would like to, you know, resubmit as forced. Uh, some of them even called us because we have, you know, outage, outage coordination process. We have, you know, numbers and emails and we, we try to accommodate people through that process. And uh, some of them said, you know, this is, you know, why do you deny my outage? And we said, you know, this, this we have a, a capacity shortfall and we can't let this plant outage go. And they they said we're going to go ahead and resubmit it. So we we kind of... Do you think it was a legitimate outage, or do you think um, that it was it became forced because they couldn't find replacement capacity? Could you dwell? Could you dive into that just a little bit? Uh, so yeah, some of them, some of them were legit. They call us and they say, you know, yes, we planned this a long time ago, but if we don't take, we don't do the maintenance work, our we risk you know, equipment failure, and we really have to take the outage. And in that scenario, we tell them, yeah, this is, this is falls under a forced outage definition. It's, it's an imminent failure of equipment, and you can go ahead and take, it, take the outage. Uh, but a decent number was not. It was just simply, you know, we scheduled our crews, and it's a, it's a you know, maintenance outage, and it's inconvenience for us that you denied the outage, uh, and we're going to go ahead and take it anyway. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, David, I, I think it's important to sure. understand some background here. Yeah, definitely. So we'll just let's finish out on this thread. Why did we do the, the PRR in the first place? So as Abdul said, we identified lots of cases where this was happening. I think as he reflected in the, the outage tickets, it was openly saying this is what we're doing. And we were sort of surprised that participants were openly saying that you denied it as a maintenance outage, we're submitting as forced. So, you know, we had a choice. We could just treat it as a, an enforcement or, or compliance type of issue and just deal with it that route. Um, but the number of parties that were doing it uh, combined with their responses where they didn't even appreciate that it was problematic suggested that there was something more that should be done aside from just sort of looking at it as a compliance matter and just going that route. So that's how we came up with BPM. And when you say a compliance matter, you could potentially refer uh, for a violation of the tariff. Exactly, okay. yeah. Okay, thank you. So it forced us really to think through two questions. Is it 
fair to the market participants to let them continue on this way if, if it's possible that they didn't understand it was problematic or there was signs pointing in that direction. Uh, and then also, if we know this is a problem, we've identified it, shouldn't we do something to stop it from continuing to happen? Right. And that's how we, we decided to do the BPM route, which is to lay out the two main purposes of it I explained before, to provide notice of our interpretation and then to explain, okay, well, you may disagree with that interpretation, but that's our interpretation. Here's what we're going to do about it if we see that the suspect conduct happens in the future. And so at least they can make an informed uh, informed decision. Okay. And so that was the point of doing the PRR. Um, and then so it does raise the question then, well, uh, the appeal has gotten to this point. It's gotten some um, some attention. So, you know, if the appeal were granted at this point, the language were removed from the PRR, you know, removed from the audit management BPM, you know, parties have been given notice by this point. And mm -hmm. that's happened either way. So I think, you know, in the short term, if the language were removed, you know, maybe not much would change. But we think it's important, uh, you know, over time, memories fade, people move on to the next thing, and we're not going to have it as clearly documented as we would if it remains in the BPM. And then, um, you know, likewise, there can be new market participants that come along that maybe weren't, um, you know, weren't part of the IFO market today that maybe next year or next month or whatnot, you know, they wouldn't have anywhere to go to see it clearly documented unless they went and sort of picked through the BPM appeal process, which is right. not the most transparent way to, to let them know. So that's why, you know, on the one hand, we're saying, you know, if the appeal were granted, we're not sure it would accomplish necessarily what the appellants seem to want. But on the other hand, we do think it's important that it stay in place. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I think, you know, at, at this point, maybe we'll go back to the, the second slide I had. What is planned to force out of reporting? Right. So we've already gotten into that a bit, but just to make sure we're all sort of on the same same page here, when we use that term, plan to force outage reporting, what does it mean? We're using that to refer to a, a forced outage. Uh, the submission of a forced outage after the ISO has rejected the same or substantially similar outage uh, when it was already submitted as a maintenance outage. So in terms of our terminology, that's what we mean. Uh, importantly, this can occur for both transmission and generation outages. Um, as Abdul already uh, started speaking to, this is uh, really most uh, most prevalent of an issue with generation and particularly with uh, generators that are providing RA capacity. So let me just sketch out what is the tie to RA here. It's that RA resources have unique outage reporting issues that are different from generators that are not providing RA capacity. If their planned outage would put the ISO short of RA capacity on a given day, then they have what's called a planned outage substitution obligation, which really just means they have to provide an all a substitute uh, unit to provide that capacity. Um, the deadline to provide that is eight days before the outage is supposed to start. Uh, if that replacement capacity is not provided, then they risk the outage being canceled because it would put the, the system short of its needed RA capacity. Can I ask uh, a dual question real quick? Uh, this is probably may or may not be germane to this, but does it have to be of the same, like, if it were a unit in a local capacity area, does it have to be a like-for-like -like characteristic replacement? Or could a local unit, from a substitution perspective, also, if you follow outside of yeah. the constrained area and mm -hmm. just be in the system? Uh, you know, for, so for planned outages, uh, the substitution requirements are more uh, flexible, so they can provide substitute capacity from any unit that's internal to the California ISO Balancing Authority. Um, it doesn't have to be in the same local area. Yeah. That restriction happens to forced out of substitution where we have more, you know, restriction on if it's a local resource, it has to be local and some other criteria. But the planned outage substitution is just any unit internal to ISO balancing. Okay, thanks, Dr. Right. So the question is, you know, we've identified this practice and we've sort of, obviously, if we're here, there's something problematic about it that we'd like to stop. So what is it that makes this uh, of concern? So really the reason is the ISO determined that the outage should not move forward for liability-based concerns. The outage gets taken anyway after the ISO said no. And so it raises the question, what is the purpose of the ISO having um, denied the outage if it just happens anyway? 
And, you know, as, as I said there a minute ago, this is most uh, directly tied to RA issues, so it also could be seen as undermining the purpose of the RA program if we have an RA unit that's signed up to provide the capacity and it has not, and then because of this outage practice, it's not meeting the capacity needs for which it was initially designated as RA capacity. So those are sort of on the operational level why this was seen as being problematic. Um, so moving to the next slide, since, since I did say it at the, the start, this is primarily sort of a, a debate over tariff provisions and, and whether, you know, what the legal issues are with this outage reporting. So we've identified two reasons uh, depending on the circumstances, and that's an important point that we're not ever saying that this uh, outage reporting practice is automatically, sus is automatically prohibited. Um, there's reasons why it would be perfectly allowable, but there's two sort of reasons in theory why it could be a problem depending on the circumstances. So the first is ISO tariff section 9.3.2 says that, Jack, says that uh, taking an outage for planned maintenance without getting final ISO approval is not allowed. So with the planned force scenario, you know, it's clear they submitted a maintenance outage ahead of time, so there's some element of maintenance that was planned for. The ISO withheld the approval and that the outage went ahead and happened anyway. It seems to, to it stands reason that that seems like it was taking an outage for planned maintenance and the ISO did not provide approval. Um, so the second part of it is that um, there's FERC regulations against submitting false information to an ISO or to market monitor. Um, and then in submitting the outage as a forced outage, if it doesn't actually meet our definition of a forced outage, then it can be viewed as falsely representing the nature of the outage. Um, and so let me take a minute here. The definition of forced outage, uh, it takes a little bit of piecing together from various um, tariff provisions, but what it boils down to, it's an outage that couldn't be provided in time uh, to be factored into day ahead or real time market bidding. Day ahead market bidding opens at seven days, so that makes the cutoff between seven and eight days. So if you could not have submitted it before that seven, eight day cutoff, then it becomes forced because you, you, you were not able for some reason to have submitted it before the seven day cutoff. Um, that makes it a forced outage. Um, so in terms of looking at what is a force versus what is a maintenance outage, we look at, look at the key question as being, at the time the outage was submitted as a forced outage, can you identify a reason why it could not have been submitted with more than seven days notice? So, you know, you think about what we probably most typically think of as a forced outage, piece of equipment breaks unexpectedly. Well, you didn't know it was going to break with seven days notice. Okay, it makes sense. Submitted as a forced outage. Um, and then, so that same sort of principle applies to some of the exceptions that we identified um, in the PRR itself, where we provided some reasons, you know, some, some reasons why the plan to force out reporting in some cases seems like it wouldn't be problematic, it wouldn't really raise our... We gave examples. Correct. Gave examples of that's the principle based on the feedback we got in talking to stakeholders. Those were three examples that were raised were that were raised multiple times where we said, yes, that seems like it's a fair, you know, a fair case that meets this principle, so we'll put it in the BPM to provide some guidance of, of cases where it seems like if that's truly what's going on, um, we might ask some questions to confirm, um, but that would probably just be the end of, end of the issue from our perspective. Um, so I think we can move to the next slide. I think we, we covered we talked about um, why we thought this PR was an appropriate response to the issues we identified. Um, and so I think with that, we can go to the next slide. Um, so, so far I've explained why this PR made sense from the, you know, from the ISO perspective, why we thought it was an appropriate way to respond to the issue we saw in front of us. Um, we put actually before PR 1122, there was a prior PR that addressed this topic that there was a lot of uh, stakeholder feedback. We withdrew that PRR and then resubmitted PR 1122. We changed um, the guidance sort of based on some of the feedback to make it more useful and sort of, you know, more clear to participants. Um, so that, but we did move forward with PR 1122. We had concerns still raised from stakeholders, and then we had the appeal. So now I want to talk a little bit in response to some of the issues that have been raised on appeal. 
So I think the first point, a lot of, uh, and some of the commenters have suggested that um, we, we've uh, established a blanket rule, plan to force outages are always impermissible. And, and an important point here is that we've already gotten to is PR 1122 directly states there are some cases where the reporting could be permissible. Um, we've provided three examples of it. First, um, let's see, what were the examples? Um, first example being um, the planned outage was submitted because there was an imminent maintenance issue that was identified shortly before the forced, planned, forced versus planned time frame elapsed. So if you might have uh, identified an imminent uh, safety issue at 10 days out, that would fall fallen into the maintenance outage time frame, but it's really an imminent problem. You know, so it, if it has to be resubmitted in the forced time frame, it would make sense. The second example is there's changed circumstances between the time the planned and forced outages were submitted. And then the third uh, example, which I think was uh, a pretty major one for a lot of participants, was the idea that um, if, if the maintenance outage is canceled, if you now for some reason have to wait an extended period of time to do the work because there's uh, specialized vendors, contractors coming in, there's only a small number of, of staff who are qualified to do the work, if canceling the maintenance outage now means you have to wait four or five, six months, um, and waiting that amount of time would put uh, the unit at operational risk, um, then we view that as acceptable because at the time you're submitting as a forced outage, given the circumstances you face, it, you really can't wait to provide notice within the maintenance outage time frame. So those were the three examples in the PRR. Uh, and separately, six cities has pointed out, um, there's a section of our tariff 9.3.6.4.1D. Um, we addressed that at length in our answering brief, uh, pages eight and nine. Uh, but basically that tariff section uh, references a case where the plan to force outage submission is contemplated under tariff, but it does cover a very narrow circumstance. It covers the case where uh, there's a change in dates to a previously approved maintenance outage, and it says if uh, that change in dates to the previously approved outage uh, is not approved, it can be resubmitted as forced. So we're not ignoring that section. We acknowledge that's in the tariff. Um, but that's really a narrow circumstance where that's addressed, and we don't agree that that alone should be taken as, as a tariff, allowing it in all cases. Um, other parts of the tariff make clear that the plan to force outage reporting is um, suspect activity. Um, so the next uh, point that's been raised on there, the second bullet point, uh, some participants have said that this PRR represents a policy change that's not appropriate to go in a BPM, but instead it's something that should go in the tariff as part of a full-fledged stakeholder process. Um, and on the staff side, we don't agree with that. Uh, we see this as reinforcing the existing tariff authorities, and the PRR does not claim any new authority that's not already in the tariff. Uh, these are long-standing tariff provisions. The outage reporting provisions have been in the tariff in some form, I think pretty much since ISO startup, it's evolved over time, but basic, basic rules have been there all along. And so we, we think the fact that the parties would view this as a new policy, yet the basic tariff provisions have been in place for, for over 20 years, reinforces to us the, the, that clarifying it in the BPM was the right approach. So the third sort of main argument we've seen on the appeal, uh, in the answering brief, and, and you know, we address this issue of false information, and there are some uh, cases that address the question of um, whether it violates the false information rule to submit a transaction to the ISO under a certain category where the transaction doesn't fit the definition of that category. Um, for, for there's, there's orders there uh, supporting the idea that that is false information. In those cases, it dealt with wheeling transactions where the definition of a wheeling transaction has to meet certain criteria. In that case, it was it's from an external load to the ISO. The, trans the transactions in question did not have that. Participants submitted them as wheeling transactions anyway. FERC found that it was false information to have done so. Um, we think that it's fairly analogous to the case of submitting a forced outage when it doesn't actually meet the definition of a forced outage. Um, that's the best indication we have of how FERC 
would view the application of the false information rule to these questions, to these cases. Um, and important to us, we think it's close enough to justify the position that it's something that FERC would, would want to hear about. Um, I think Six Cities, at least, has raised the point that, you know, some of those cases are settlement, settlement agreements between Office of Enforcement and the parties. They're not necessarily precedent in the sense of it's a full-fledged um, commission order. Um, we acknowledge that there are, that is true. Um, we also acknowledge these are settlements. We acknowledge that this, those cases dealt with wheeling transactions, not out reporting. Um, so we acknowledge that is true, but they still to us represent the best information we have to go on in terms of how FERC would view this. Uh, and we do think it's close enough that it's reasonable to say this is something FERC would find problematic. With all the uh, with all the ISOs and all the history, there's no case history of this at FERC other than what you just described? Um, well, first of all, the enforcement process moves slowly, so yeah. there might be things in the pipeline. But um, so there are definitely reported cases on the false information rule. Right. Um, I, I think the most concrete ones are these wheeling transaction cases. Or there haven't been any in the, the plan to force out its context. No, that, not not that I'm aware of. If there are, but I think there's that would be important. To no, I don't. I don't right. believe there's false there's information there. precedent, though. Right. Okay. Right. Um, so one of the other arguments we we've heard is that um, sort of focusing on the idea of gaming or market manipulation, uh, some participants are pointing out that. You know, there's a lot more that goes into a, a case of market manipulation or market gaming, and that this outage reporting issue on its own really doesn't fit that. And on that point, we, we agree, but what we'd also say is PRR 1122 is not about a market issue. We're not looking at market impacts or, or potential harm to the market from this conduct. This is really firmly in the operational and reliability space. And so the questions of market manipulation and market impacts are really uh, beside the point on the particular uh, conduct we're looking to address. Um, and so finally, a, a point that, that's really important to, to cover is that, you know, in our view, what, what, what's driven this reporting is we hear from market participants that, um, you know, the outages, the outages get canceled sort of randomly or it's unpredictable and it's hard to know and it creates a lot of uncertainty for them. You know, and on that point, you know, we feel it's necessary to push back a little bit. Um, we don't believe that most of these cases are all that random or unpredictable. Um, as we said, this is most often driven by RA issues. Um, and there's two factors related to the cancellation in those cases that are within the generator's control. So first of all, planned out and substitution obligations are assigned in priority order based on when the outage was submitted. So something that is uh, in the control of the generator is submitting their outages earlier. They'll get a higher priority. They'll reduce the chances of ever getting the outage substitution obligation. The second point is the cancellation is only triggered once they have failed to provide the substitution. So in that case, there's another reason why you see it as within the generator's control to affect this. Um, so with that, those were the main points we, we read on the, the appeals that we thought were sort of in opposition to the, uh, to the PRR. Um, I think if there's no more questions, I think we can um, let the appellants have their say. Sure. Thank you, David. Um, I think we've got Rebecca Shelton and Bonnie Blair uh, representing Six Cities on the line. You want to go ahead? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Rebecca Shelton from Thompson Coburn, and my colleague Bonnie Blair is here with me. And um, we represent the cities of Anaheim, Azusa, Banning, Colton, Pasadena, and Riverside, California, um, which we refer to as the six cities. Um, so our, our position has been throughout our, uh, our appeal and our underlying comments is that PRR 1122 introduces a new policy into the outage management BPM that creates the presumption that submitting a planned or forced outage, and that's the, the CAISO's terminology that they've been using, and, and we're adopting that as well. Um, submitting a planned or forced outage constitutes the submission of false or misleading information. Um, and we've identified both process issues with PR 1122 and substantive issues with the content that the CAISO has included through its revision. 
Um, first, there's a process issue because PR 1122 seeks to implement a substantive change in policy for a VPN revision rather than through a stakeholder process leading to a proposed tariff revision that would have to be approved by FERC. Um, the CAISO has implied today that it has unilateral authority to decide whether certain conduct is prohibited and to implement that authority through the BPM, even though the tariff doesn't provide for that authority. Um, however, the BPM must be in line with the tariff, and if there's any question as to that, that point, um, FERC itself has stated that it's imperative that information in BPM be consistent with the tariff, which was actually in a CAISO case in 2008. Um, and the BPM revision to implement a change of this nature, therefore, requires a tariff revision developed through the stakeholder process and approved by FERC. Um, there's also a substantive issue with PR 1122 because um, PR 1122 is inconsistent with FERC's policies um, in that it proposes to treat submissions that are factually accurate as false and misleading information without any indication of misconduct. So from the process standpoint, the CAISO's new outage management policy is a substantive change inconsistent with the CAISO tariff, and the CAISO has yet to provide any references to the tariff that support its, its ability really to claim this presumption that submission of a plan to forced outage is false or most, is, is the um, submission of false or misleading information. I didn't hear any um, tariff provisions that were cited today that would support that. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, I just, my slides really just lay out some of the tariff provisions that we cite today just for ease of reading the text so I don't have to go through and read it all to you. Um, we have it. We have it, Rebecca. Okay, great. Thank you. And, I see we, on the and we reviewed it. Rebecca, okay. um, well, I'll, if you want to go through your slides, I have questions. you want me to wait? No, go ahead. Well, I'd kind of like to to dissect the substance issue and then the process issue. Is that okay? Yes. Um, and I welcome, I know, Scott, you're on the phone as well? From PG&E? Yes, I am. Okay. You know, I welcome your responses to my questions as well, just for, I don't know if I'm breaking process here, but. Um, <laughs> And make it. Yeah. Make anyway, you know, you'll, you'll indulge me. Um, on the substance issue, I'm I'm interested in how you think this should work because I think you've in, you've indicated that you you think we've misinterpreted. I, these are my words, not yours. Um, the tariff and. If we talk first about the substance of the issue and how we think it should work, I think the process side of it follows pretty easily. Is that okay? Yes. So, so um, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, so from our standpoint, how it should work is something that I think we would really need to work out, and I think it goes back to the process issue, unfortunately, but something that we would need to work through in a comprehensive stakeholder process. Um, we don't think that there should be just a presumption that submitting a plan to forced outage constitutes forced or misleading, I mean, I'm sorry, false or misleading information, um, because there are multiple scenarios, and scenarios beyond those that are listed in PRR 1122, most likely, where that would not be the case. So the concern is that the the language as it's included in PR 1122 would give the CAISO the discretion without really setting forth any criteria, any process, or any way, it, really any explanation of how to rebut the presumption um, that the submission of the information is false and misleading. And then, which, which then leads to the, the consequence, which is referral of the issues to FERC, which is which is a process and it's expensive and it's time consuming and it's a burden on stakeholders, market participants, and on FERC itself. And and that burden is placed on everyone based on a submission of, based on a referral where there was no false or misleading statements, everything done was within what's allowed by the tariff and the, um, and, 
everything was true and accurate and communication was transparent. Rebecca, this is Roger Collinson. Um, so as I'm looking at the BPM, and I'm, I'm scanning it quickly, I have read it in full before, but I don't see the word presumption. And as I read it, and this is my kind of summary of it, I thought what it was saying was that it could be, and there were, we would have to look at the circumstances from which it went from planned to forced, and then that we can't identify all instances where they would be appropriate to do that, but we gave some examples which refer, as I understood it, back to the um, specific provisions in the tariff and where it could be appropriate. So I thought it was um, you know, kind of slicing and dicing that in the way that you're suggesting. So I'm wondering, is there is it a semantics issue? Is there a word or words or an ordering of the BPM that would in your mind, get rid of this presumption? Because I don't actually see that presumption. I, I guess to us, they, they do not use the words presumption, that's correct. Um, to us, it's the language that um, the, the um, it's generally not appropriate for, for the um, PTO or scheduling, scheduling corner to submit these plan to force outages, and the resubmission could be viewed as submitting false or misleading information or taking an outage not authorized by the ISO. That language together, the way that we read it, seems to create this presumption that that activity is in and of itself a, a problem or prohibited. Um, and I believe the Kaiser actually used the word prohibited. And then the other problem with that is that the BPM is intended to interpret the tariff but we don't, you, you don't know from looking at this or from actually reading the tariff what tariff provisions underlie these statements to go back and look and get guidance on that and how it would be applied. So there's no criteria here and there's no criteria in the tariff that would tell you how this is applied and doesn't just give the kinds of discretion outside of the BPM or the tariff. Can I go to the, the heart, some of the substance of the matter because I think that will really help us uh, I mean, I think there are multiple um, paths to try to resolve this thing, you know, from you know, rewording the, um, uh, the BPM itself um, to doing a tariff process to doing other things. But, but kind of before I think we, we think about that, I want to make sure we're sort of on the same page. And I, I get that if you're suggesting we do a, a – a, um, a uh, stakeholder process around the tariff language, that this may be, um, you know, prejudicing that. But I think we can agree, and I'll use these words, you agree if you wish or not, that we shouldn't allow a plan to forced outage for anything other than that outage now becomes an imperative to take out. Is that a fair, are those fair words? I, I think it's really something that would need to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. It's, I, I think it's... I, well, I mean, I, 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 you know, right, but I, I agree with that. I think each one has to be evaluated and tested against that. But that's why I'm trying to just put a principle out there that we, we, we ha implicitly the ISO has to have the authority to approve or deny a planned outage. I think we can all agree to that. Then with that, I apologize for interrupting. Please continue. Yeah, no, I want, I want you to talk. Go ahead. Um, I would say that pg e does agree with that. You do not need PRR 1122 to get that authority. We agree that the current tariff language has that authority, gives us that authority, yes. Okay, we're all lined on that. Because and I think it gets to whether we need this this um, BPM change or not. Now, um, what we want to do, though, I think David, I'm taking putting more germ out. We wanted because we have this tariff language, and Abdul, your group saw that this was a problem. Mm -hmm. That's what spurred you on to do this. Correct. So I guess then it leads, Scott, if you might, or whoever wants to jump in, is 
how do we get to the heart of that problem? Um, because if we're going to make a tariff, let's say we go down the path of a process issue and do a, a, a tariff change and do a stakeholder process around that, my concern is we're going to end up at the same place, which is the principles are that it, you shouldn't be changing from a plan to force outage unless it's truly a force outage, which I think everybody agreed with. Um, and that um, we do have the discretion of denying a planned outage for reliability reasons. So what I'm trying to get at the heart at is if everybody agrees with those principles, then it's sort of a process issue. It's a, okay, do you do, do all the appellates disagree that this should be done in, in the BPM? or should it be done the tariff, I'm sort of presupposing that the outcome is not going to be that much different, given the principles I laid out. And I'm interested in you responding to that. Um, this is Rebecca. With regard to the first um, point you had made that the CAISO can reject the planned outage, we agree with that and we also believe that the CAISO has control over whether to accept or reject the forced outage, and in this case, the planned forced outage. Um, so to us, can, can you can you what do you mean by planned forced outage? In the, plan in the two case, plan plan two forced or a planned forced outage? <laughs> I mean by by the term planned to force, I mean in the way that the kind of force. I got gotcha. you. I didn't I didn't get to two. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Um. Or really, in either case, it could it can. The CAISO can reject and has the discretion to reject a forced outage. It has the discretion to reject a planned outage, and it has the discretion to reject a planned to forced outage. I don't, Abdul, is that, it, is it's that correct? It's a condition to acquire. Rebecca, this is Abdul so I, I, from operations. I think um, there's a dilemma that maybe we're missing here, which is, as David said, forced outages, we see them as imminent or failure due to their timelines in the tariff, seven days or less. You cannot give us head notice. That means to us in operations, we understand the forced outage, that something I have to do it within seven days or already happened. There's no way around it. So we give high priority to forced outages. We do and everything. Great discretion, too. Right. Then, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you've ever turned, do you ever turned out a forced? Not that I, I didn't. So I, I'm not aware of forced outages that we deny. That's, a, that's how we treat forced outages. And so when someone comes in and resubmit a planned outage as forced, they're really, one, they're messing up the entire reliability studies process where we come in and we give them that priority exception that, hey, what can we, what everything we can do to get that first hour to happen. It also gives, I think, unfair, potential unfair treatment to other planned outages that submitted ahead of time, perhaps via substitution. They're going through, and we go back and we might say, you're a forced outage, you have to go. Planned outage, just a maintenance outage, we might have to reschedule you. So, you provide, you know, unfair treatment potentially to other folks, and, make the entire process really moot. Okay, Abdul. Hey, I want to do a process check. Um, Scott and Rebecca and Bonnie, I assume you're on the phone too. I want to be uh, respectful of the process here and to make sure you guys, I don't want to jump jump your case, if you will. And if I'm doing that, um, please, uh, please say so. Uh, but I, I want to just kind of get at some of the heart of the matter, if that's okay. That's, this is Rebecca. That's um, definitely fine with us. And, and if I could, I actually have a response to what was just of said course. about forced outages. And, and, I, and I think there's a disconnect between how the CAISO is thinking about these forced outages and what's actually said in the tariff. Um, the, the only thing that makes an outage forced based on the language in the tariff is the timing of when it's submitted. There's nothing in the tariff in the definition of forced outage that says that that outage is imminent in nature. Um, the definition contemplates timing only based on factoring an outage into the day ahead market or the real the real time market bidding processes, which is really, I believe, 72 hours if you look at um, the BPM for market operations, section 
four, um, there it makes clear that outages can be reflected in the day ahead market optimization until at least 72 hours prior to the trading day. Um, so there's no requirement in the tariff that the forced outage be one that is imminent, and there's no language that says that, um, that there's no really reason for the seven-day cutoff based on, based on that. It's really just kind of an arbitrary cutoff. Rebecca, um, do, you, do you think then some clarification of what you just described in the BPM would be helpful, like just capturing what Abdul um, uh, described as how they evaluate it? I, I think that that would be something that should be in the tariff. If it's going to be in the BPM, it would first have to be a policy change included in the tariff and language in the tariff that would describe that process. David, can, can I ask our attorney to respond? David, can you? Yeah, yeah. No, I think that, David, I, I'd like to hear, I mean, we've given three examples in the BPM mm -hmm. where we think that planned to force would be appropriate. Right. So is there tariff support for those three examples? Are there specific tariff sections? Or how did we come up with those examples? Right, so it goes back to the definition of a forced outage. It, it, it's something that could not have been factored into the day ahead bidding process, which opens, bidding opens seven days. So that's how we landed on this idea that. And, and let me interrupt you, sir. Where is that definition of forced out, outage or something? It's an appendix A. It's an okay. appendix A, and it says something that could not be factored into the day ahead market? Yes. And so that, that's how, how we, we, yeah. But that doesn't capture what Abdul just said. Well, no, it, it's... I, I get it that we can't put it in the day ahead market, but it also doesn't give you some perspective about how they're evaluating it. Oh, okay. The, yeah. That, that goes to a second point I wanted to, to raise. So, you know, I think the tariff does, in multiple places, talk about the ISO's approval authority over maintenance outages. There isn't similar language relating to forced outages. Well, I, and I don't think they're arguing our authorities. I think what they're arguing is that they don't have a clear definition of how we're evaluating it. Well, what, what I was getting at is that, you know, they're saying, well, you can always just project a forced outage, but I think tariff doesn't really address that authority, and so that suggests where Abdul was going is we don't have that authority because it's, it's plus presumed to be, yeah. as something that, that's imminent that needs to be treated you know, with that deference to, to the generator submitting it. And so also the question you initially posed to me about clarifying that force versus plan cutoff, you know, today it, it's a concrete thing. It, you know, we're hearing some feedback that, you know, seven, eight days might be arbitrary, but the good thing about it is at least there's a clear definition, it's seven days or eight days versus if we get into a fourth outage is appropriate when this or that or this other event happens. What about the fourth and fifth sort of thing we didn't think about? That would become a lot harder to find in the tariff, you know, tied to what specific thing happens to trigger the outage versus having a clear thing saying, would you have been able to submit it earlier? And at least it's not perfect, but it's more concrete. Well, but here's how I view that is that you, the seven days out is, you can't have a planned outage less than seven days notice. So therefore, within that seven day window, implicitly it has to be a forced outage. And if it's a forced outage, here's how we evaluate it. Here's how we would evaluate it, just as you described, Abdul. That's how I, anyway, that's yeah, my that's, reading. That's anyway, but I wanna make sure that we let Rebecca and uh, Scott and speak and respond. So this is uh, Scott with Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Um, I want to go back to one of the comments that was made on the slides presented by the ISO that um, talks about one of the benefits to the PRR being the opportunity to avoid problems before they happen. And I think the confusion that, you're, that um, is being spoken about right now is really a challenge to, to that objective and is of great concern to us in the way in which the PRR is described. Um, it it um, provides what appears to be a harsh result for a process that we look to the BPM to help us define the procedure and examples to work through and to align with the tariff. 
And this PRR does not seem to accomplish that. It in fact creates confusion with a result that has created uh, fear or concern from market participants that will have market reaction. And that's because that it implies that it's a it's prohibited and it can be referred to FERC. The lack that's of clarity, or, the lack of clarity around how to achieve an appropriate answer for the the asset manager creates a fear and concern that it would be provided to FERC, and it almost appears to escalate the one criteria used to evaluate forced outages that it moves from planned to forced, it almost escalates that above the other 10 that are identified, or nine that are identified, which creates greater concern for market participants. Let me provide some context to that comment. So there's another part, there's one part of the tariff, uh, and this is getting to the comment I made about uh, this concern is about reliability. This isn't about the market impact there's a section of the tariff in Section 9 that talks about um, outages, questionable outage reporting that the ISO could send a report to FERC about. Mm -hmm. And it talks, it provides like nine or ten um, factors to consider. One That's of which it. is this, the outage, it was a forced outage that had recently been denied as planned. Um, it provides some other factors as well to consider. So that's the nine or ten factors. I see. Thank you. So those factors or basically um, a VPM basically is, is playing off of that one factor of going from one thing that we would consider, and I think what you're saying in the VPM is that's one thing we would look at is if it went from plan to force, and that's specifically in that fa those factors in the tariff. But um, singling out that one is what he's saying, right? right. Singling out that one. Right, and, and that goes to the, the idea that those factors were really constructed, you know, in response to energy crisis about some of the conduct that happened there. It was really targeted at market impacts. I see. And so what we're saying is you can set that section aside and just look at does it meet the tariff definition, yes, no. We believe in a lot of cases it probably wouldn't. What do you do if that happens? And then it's following the sort of normal uh, – Path potentially leading to a FERC Okay. If I may, add, Steve, sure. uh, I, and just to clarify, I see. That, I mean, Scott, I think what I understood is you worried about participants, you know, having uh, kind of hesitation and are worried about submitting outages and if they violate the rule. I think something to clarify. I mean, we don't report people to FERC, you know. Uh, Willy nilly. Right. <laughs> we, you know, we, the engineers who are studying the outages, if they suspect, they refer them, you know, to me or to management. We review them, secondary review. Uh, we check the rules, get collect all the information. If we really believe that this is purely a planned outage, a maintenance outage that could have been pushed to a later date, and was resubmitted as forced. Uh, due to lack of substitution in this case. Then, after all that investigation, we hand it over to our DMM department. DMM department then goes in and does their, you know, their investigation. And if all of that results in an I, you know, ISO believing truly that this you know, entity violated the tariff or submitted false info or did not submit a proper forced outage, then it goes to FERC. So there's a lot of checks that happen. But in their defense, I mean, they don't. They don't know that we're asking them to trust us, right? I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and Scott, is that yes? Is that a fair observation? I agree with what you just said. We okay. do not know that, and I don't deny that the ISO has a robust process. Yeah. As a market participant, we are not privy to that, and we look to the BPM to help us understand how we should appropriately work within the confines that are set up for us that align with the tariff. There's a little bit of confusion created by this PRR about alignment with the tariff and the, the fear of a ramification, knowing, not knowing what that entire process is and how to appropriately evaluate it from our perspective to be within the guidelines that are provided and the rules that are provided. Scott, I understand this went through 
substantial stakeholdering, I guess is the best term for it, for over a year. How, I mean, how did it not play out to sort of address what Scott's raising? I don't know how better to ask that question. Um, yeah, I guess I can take a first stand. This is David. So yeah, we, um, I, I forget when the prior PR was put out. I mean, we tried to address um, the comments that were raised by stakeholders along the way. Um, Including revisions and yeah. further. And, and so I think, you know, we, this conversation highlights the opportunity for some minor incremental changes to the PRR that would be sort of consistent with what we're getting at. So sure, you can always improve the language of the BPM, but I think how we got here is fundamentally we reached a point where any further changes would really just be minor tweaks. And I think it felt like we were, we were just had irreconcilable differences. Okay. That, that the question of, you know, do, is it going to come down to a fact specific determination on a given outage? We thought, yes, it will, and we can provide as much guidance as, as we could, but there's only so much we can do. And, you know, this idea that there's this uncertain process that, that the PG representative was talking about. Yeah. Um, we thought we provided guidance. I don't know, you know, we could, for example, say, well, you know, staff and operations engineering services will review it first and you know, reach out to the participant first before it goes to DMM, which is what we've sort of established as a, a process. So we could provide those sort of details. It didn't feel like those sort of additional details were really going to bridge the gap. Fair enough. Rebecca, oh, I, I think I, you were going to, yeah, I think you were going to say yeah. something. Yeah, actually, to that point, I think um, one of the, the issues that we found is that a lot of the process is automated. And, and what our clients found is you go through this process, it's all automated, and then you get to the point where you're being referred to FERC. And there's not really a lot of back and forth where you can explain what's going on, and it's just, it's, it's not clear what's going on in the process on the CAISO's end. Rebecca, if we had added some of the language that Scott was trying to get at and that you just articulated, would that get at it, or do you still believe this needs to be in the tariff itself? Um, I still believe there needs to be support in the tariff in order to make those changes to the BPM. And it's sort of companion language, if you will. Yes, and that's how we view the BPM, as companion language, as, comp as clarifying language. It shouldn't conflict with or go beyond what's provided in the tariff. Okay. I, th I think I have enough. <laughs> Rebecca, do you have any other comments that um, you haven't already covered? Um, I, I think one of the points that we wanted to make, and this is kind of in response to um, some of the statements that CAISO has made about this PRR, this, these actions that the CAISO would take, the referral to FERC being for the purpose of reliability, and, and we really see it as kind of the opposite. We see the operational risk being from the, the fact that market participants, that these scheduling quarters will not be able to submit outages or will be, there might be a chilling effect on, on submitting those outages because they're concerned about these referrals to FERC. They may have a maintenance outage that was rejected and there's that fear of resubmitting it within the fourth time, within the fourth outage time frame, even though the tariff and business practice manuals permit maintenance outages to be permitted within the fourth outage time frame, there's a concern that they would just they would have to hold off on that outage, and then the unit, the generating unit, the transmission line will not be available when it's really needed, which would cause potentially a bigger reliability problem. So we, Rebecca, we have do you, do, you, do you think that chilling effect, I think that also Scott was trying to describe, do you think that's sort of the heart of the issue? Yes, I, th I do think that's, that's part of it, yes. Okay. This, this is Bonnie. I, I think that's the I think that's the driving force behind the resources that the appellants have have committed to this appeal. Yeah. Um, if we if we didn't think it would matter, we wouldn't have spent the time and energy to 
you know, to to keep pushing on this. Um, I, yeah, that's that's that comes through clearly, Bonnie. And uh, that's what I mean. That's why we set this process up so that we can hear um, hear from you what your your concerns are, and. Um, you know what we I, I hope you've heard from the question that we have that um, we can see your concerns I, the questions have been very helpful yes I would uh, this is Scott from pg and &E. I would agree with that and and your concern is evident in the discussion today and and has been to date and we appreciate it but to the point that was made is there has been a significant amount of time and energy and effort spent by a, a large group of people because we feel this is an important issue and does need to be addressed. Okay. Okay. Uh, Process-wise. Yeah. Any other, I just want to make sure that both the appellants um, have any more comments to make and then we'll turn it over to stakeholder. Um, so Scott and Rebecca and Bonnie, you're, you're okay, you're good. Okay. Um, let's move to public. Yeah, we're okay. We're okay. okay. Thank you. Um, any public uh, a person who wishes to make a comment, we're going to limit it to five minutes um, per stakeholder, uh, if we have um, any. So maybe I'll turn it over to Isabella to work with the operator. Sure. So um, we'd like to open it up to stakeholder comment at this point. Um, since NCPA and NCE did submit written stakeholder briefs, we'd like to give them the opportunity to voice their comments first. So if um, either SCQ or NCPA are on the line, you can enter the queue by pressing pound two. And Candace, um, will you please let us know if there's anyone in the queue? We have one person just raised their hand. Go ahead. Hi there, this is, hi, this is Latif Narani on behalf of NCPA. Um, thanks for um, letting us chime in. Um, I wish we were in the room with you guys. It would be much easier um, to be there with uh, the ISO staff to, to figure this out. Um, but I think from NCPA's perspective, you know, we have a lot of real world, real world experience with this, um, and some of the ideas we've heard sort of don't reflect the experience of stakeholders. Um, you know, when we heard things like, um, you know, we don't report people to FERC willy nilly, and we have all these review processes, and we you know, we check with people or, or we hear from people, that has happened sometimes. We, you know, we've, um, we've seen examples um, where uh, ISO staff does reach out um, to follow up before maybe going to referrals, but we've also seen examples um, where there is complete transparency, like Abdul mentioned, um, you know, to talk to the operator and explain what's going on, um, and they understand that it's a legitimate outage uh, that needs to happen uh, even though um, the, 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 for whatever reason the, the planned outage could happen on the day that the work needs to be done. The operator understands everything was transparent um, and yet still uh, you get a FERC referral without um, any further communication. So the, in practice, you know, in the, the, the ideal version of the way things are supposed to work um, might be better, but in practice it it clearly doesn't always work that way. Um, I think that's also true um, of, you know, this issue that David raised of, you know, the, the dividing line between forced and planned outages being a seven-day or eight-day limit is clear, but if you start getting into the practical details of um, is this a substantial risk of failure or maybe just a likely risk of failure in the future, those real-world engineering judgments that what I heard was we wanted to avoid getting into are exactly the kinds of issues that this PRR creates because now you have to decide uh, because of this PRR, there's this default assumption that a plan to force outage is uh, impermissible unless you can demonstrate that it's worthwhile. And now market participants and engineers who made a judgment about, you know, this part can't wait another three months to get fixed. Now you have to justify that was a substantial risk. Um, that's a that's a tough position to put real world people in. To say you're going to be you know you're going to have to answer FERC and you're going to get your lawyers involved and um, it's going to be very costly just to even answer a data request. 
frankly, um, because um, some somebody um, thought that your judgment about how imminent a risk is uh, was wrong, and that's a that's a, that presumption the PR creates that unless you can prove this is legitimate, um, we're gonna we're gonna uh, send you to the cops is uh, is a pretty indiscriminate way and difficult way for us to react. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, we have a couple more people on the line. Your line is unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, folks. It's Mark Smith with Calpine. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Mark. Good, good. Thanks, folks, first of all, for joining on this. Um, we, we support the appellants as well. Um, and let me just raise a couple of things maybe that haven't been discussed so far. Uh, the first being sort of the, the position that we're put into, and the second being um, my, my assertion that substitution is a false option. Um, so, so let's talk about an outage that was submitted two months prior. It was approved by the ISO, and 10 days or two weeks beforehand, the ISO uh, cancels the, their approval. Um, this is a condition that occurs very frequently to Calpine. <laughs> um, and given that very short notice, um, we are left with a Hobson's choice. And that Hobson's choice, I'm going to ignore the costs of staging contractors or equipment or anything like that, but the Hobson's choice that we have is risk failure of the equipment that we intended to maintain, placing it in jeopardy with respect to the CPUC's general order 167. That's a bad option. Or two, take the force outage. Generally, we do our best to work with Abdul and all the rest of the people in outage management specifically to figure out when we can take it and scope it down and scale it down. But nonetheless, at some point, we may have to take it as a forced outage, putting us in jeopardy for a FERC referral under the presumption, and I, I completely agree with Six Cities, that the language um, is guilty until proven innocent. There's a presumption that it's false and misleading until you can prove um, something else. So that Hobson's choice is a very difficult position for generators to be in. Um, <clears throat> now I want to just turn to the other issue, which is substitution. Now if we get a notice eight days or ten days beforehand, when we have a previously approved outage for an 800 megawatt unit or a 500 megawatt unit for three days, going to the market to try to find 800 megawatts for three days is simply not possible. There is no liquidity available for that. So that's kind of a false option, and we can't hang our hat on the ability to substitute that very late. Now, what this all kind of comes back to, I think, is that we should address this issue in the planning horizon, not in the operating horizon. We need to modify the planned outage rules so that when an outage is approved, all parties can bank on that. Now, we know that emergencies happen. We know that crap happens. But we need to set, establish rules so that planned outages, um, once approved, can be banked on. And maybe what that requires, and there is a stakeholder process already engaged considering this, is that all planned outages require substitution in advance. So. Um, Rather than focusing on the real-time impacts of whether um, an operator's judgment uh, of an imminent problem exists or not, and, and maybe second-guessing that operator's judgment, let's try to figure out how to fix it in the planning horizon. So thank you. I hope that was five thank minutes or less. Thanks, Mark. Millers, we do have a stakeholder process around that now, don't we? Yeah, part of the RA enhancement initiative. You're aware of that, Mark? Yes, 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 we're participating, yes, absolutely. That's why I'm saying, you know, <laughs> know that you need this particular PRR at this point. There is a stakeholder process to address the planned outage issues. Fair enough. Thank you, Mark. I'm sorry, this is Bonnie. If I can jump back in for a minute. The, the ISO's latest um, proposal in the RA enhancements process 
announced its intent to retain this language about force to planned outages. So I, I, I don't know that it's being considered open-mindedly in the RA enhancements process. Fair enough, Bonnie. Looks like we do have one more in the queue, so we'll go ahead and take that now. Your line is unmuted. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. This is Aditya Chauhan from SAE. Uh, I'd like to thank the Executive Appeals Committee for um, considering this matter. And uh, basically, our uh, position and our concerns uh, have been voiced by, by Calpine and NCPA and also, uh, of course, by PG&E and Six Cities. So, uh, yes, we do support uh, their positions and consideration of this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other callers on the phone? Not at this time. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks. For so the, maybe we could go. What's the timeline, yeah. Isabel? Yeah, I'll go through it. Oh, sorry. Um, so you. Okay. So the timeline um, uh, sort of lays out the idea that the committee um, will take the points raised during today's call into consideration and provide a written decision by March 11th. Um, the written decision will be posted to the BPM change management webpage. If the appeal is approved, the ISO will implement the committee decision on March 18th. If the appeal is denied, appellants may bring this issue to the next regularly scheduled board meeting. Okay. So with that... Um, Which would be March, right? It would be after the March. After the March and meeting. After the March deadline, so it would be yeah. the May meeting. May meeting. May meeting. Okay. So unless there's anything else, I think we completed well this process here. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, everybody, for your participation. Thanks, everyone, for joining, and have Thank a great day.